Hi, welcome to Grace and Peace Church. I'm Carissa May, Associate Pastor. You can reach us at graceandpeacechurch.org. We're going to have a time of worship this morning and then a teaching. We're glad you're here. Stay with us. All right, welcome everyone to another week of Grace and Peace Church Worship Online. My name's Matt. I am the worship director here at Grace and Peace Church. We're so thankful you're choosing to spend this time with us today. We're going to jump right into our worship. This week we'll be reading from Psalm, Psalm 32. And this one is just a very powerful verse of confession and opening ourselves up and just recognizing that we need God's grace, that we need God's mercy in our lives. As you're listening, I encourage you to really take some time. We'll have the words up on the screen. You can even open your Bible to Psalm 32 if you want to and read along and really allow the words to speak to us. This is not a passive listening. This is an active listening as we trust that the word of God has something to say in our hearts today. And then from there, we're going to move into a time of singing where once again, we can just open ourselves up, open up our hearts and present ourselves honestly and vulnerably before God through our singing. So we're thankful we're here. I hope this can be a beautiful and fruitful time of worship for you wherever you find yourself. And uh, I'm just excited to get into it. So let's start off with our worship with Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with the songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and brittle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds those who trust in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. So 
The sacrifices of my God are broken and contrite heart. But can't see you and you alone. Have I sinned? The sacrifices of our God are broken. continuing our series in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. If you've been following along with us, you know that Nate has called this series A Kingdom Upside Down, because throughout the text, we've been seeing Jesus flip ancient teaching on its head in order to clarify his imagination in re-giving the law, which was first handed down from God to Moses. So we're still at that point in the text where Jesus is sitting on a hillside, surrounded by his disciples and others, and he's saying things roughly like this. I know you've heard these things said before, these laws have been in your collective hands for more than a thousand years, but as I see it, in some cases, you've been repeating to one another the letter of the law and missing the spirit of the law, which was intended. And in other cases, you've padded and nuanced the laws in ways my father never intended. So take notes, my friends, because I'm gonna break this down. That's very paraphrased. Now you re may remember that Nate has been using an image of an iceberg to explain the point that Jesus is making throughout his larger teaching here. With respect to the law, Jesus implies that the Hebrew people have been dealing primarily with this upper visible portion of the ice. In fact, there's places where Jesus suggests that they're even like adding ice cubes to the peak above the waterline, piling on the plain text. But now, as Christ is teaching the law in real time, he's indicating to the disciples that they should be concerned with what lies beneath what is plainly written on the scrolls. Now I say disciples because Jesus is speaking to a particular audience at a certain time in history, but we can certainly benefit from letting Jesus teach us too, because I think it's safe to say that we often have similar difficulties discovering the intended meaning in original writings. Here's a modern example about the way people understand or misunderstand the possible layers of meaning concerning the things of God. Last week, someone sent this clip to me. The headline is, Ohio lawmaker refuses to wear mask because he says it dishonors God. And then his quote is, 
We are all created in the image and likeness of God. That image is seen the most by our face. I will not wear a mask. Now, this congressman has probably read or heard in scripture this passage. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, he seems to have assumed and then applied the term image to his belief system in the most literal, basic sense. But I have to push back on that interpretation because that level of understanding doesn't do justice to the full meaning of the text. It ignores the layers underneath the language, and I would argue carelessly so, and possibly to dangerous ends. If the image of God is just this stamp or Nate's face or yours, then the people of God need only concern themselves with the outward appearance from the neck up, right? And if that's true, unless you have a um, resting face problem, maybe you can pull off a decent imitation of goodness with a cheeky smile, but that's not great theology. That concept presumes that God Almighty in his creative form is just some grand human, but that view reduces the divine to this. It's egocentric and anthropomorphic to think that, God, that humanity wears the actualish face of God, that God is like us. I don't think so. The incarnation and the whole life of Christ demonstrates that we are made in his image, the likeness of God, to visibly represent his holy character, not his physical self. And that's why we need to know him deeply. Some years ago, the band Gunger produced a song called White Man, which challenges the notion of God that some people, maybe the congressman, ascribe to. And the opening lines are these. God is not a man, God is not a white man, God is not a man sitting on a cloud. God cannot be bought, God will not be boxed in, God will not be owned by religion. But God is love, God is love and he loves everyone. God is love, God is love and he loves everyone. Now if those lyrics are offensive to you in any way, if they shake you up, that's okay. Let's talk about it over tea sometime. Discomfort can be a call to question and questions can lead to research and study and conversation and answers and growth and transformation. That's an excellent process. And when that process is initiated, Christ followers especially can begin to deal with subtext and deep intended meaning in God's word. It's then that we can concern ourselves with issues of the heart and mind and spirit in us and in our faith communities. It's then and there that we can move past the simple and overt and submit ourselves to mining the foundational stuff of godly faith in terms of our beliefs and practices and disciplines. If I could take time with a congressman, I would tell him that, yeah, Humanity is made in the image of God, meaning that we are all enabled by grace to correspond with him, uniquely so, with respect to any other living things in all of creation. I'd also say that humanity bears the image of God as his ambassadors, each of us uniquely built with the capacity to reflect his divine goodness to the world so that all of humanity might come to know him, not by our faces, but by our love, the active love to which Christ command, commands us, and the same love Gungert refers to as the very nature or character of the Almighty. A new command I give you, says Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Now that mandate, I believe, is exactly why Jesus was out there on the mountainside hosting law school on the day that we've been talking about. So with that in mind, here's what I'd like us to ask as we get into the reading today. What is the spirit of the law to which God's people are bound? And what is the full magnitude of the law and what are its limitations? Now, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. 
You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. In these verses, Jesus is dealing with the sixth commandment, which was simply stated as you shall not murder back in Exodus chapter 20. There's a sense here, though, that with respect to the law, Israel has underestimated the related matters of ungodly anger and murderous intent. So Jesus explains the fullness of the law. Also, you may have noticed the added phrase, whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. With that comment, a discussion about judgment is placed on the table and Jesus begins to parse out the different areas of judgment and consequence to which Israel is accountable. Now, to be clear, you can just draw a line under do not murder. That's a solid command. Don't murder. But this is about paying attention to what comes next. If we look at the text through the lens of intent, we can see that Jesus is describing conditions of unrighteous anger, the kind for which there is no reason and which is being directed at a brother or sister, which we can read broadly as any human. He's talking about anger in terms that one comment commentator calls heart murder. Heart murder is not productive, but it's step one in a damaging process. It does no physical harm to the other, but it festers in the one who harbors the emotion. It is unrepentant and unforgiving anger. It is consuming as it grows into false indignation, which is void of any righteousness. And that condition ultimately presents itself as heart disease in the perpetrator. And if we are angry in some situation, the perpetrator refers to us. Now, according to the CDC, heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women and people of most racial and ethnic groups in the United States. That, of course, is a literal reading of heart disease, but today is about subtext. So I'm suggesting here that in the same way, spiritual heart disease is the leading cause of spiritual death universally. And Jesus is out there in prevention mode. Jesus is indicating that anger kills because it emanates from a spirit that opposes holiness and righteousness. It is symptomatic of a heart that is very distant from the Lord's. And prophetic words about divine judgment caution against being on the sick side of that holy diagnosis. Okay, with respect to the sixth commandment, Jesus has so far addressed murder proper and heart murder, which he says are both subject to judgment. But there's more. Jesus deals with insults next, or with what the same commentator refers to as tongue murder. Jesus said, if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council, which is judgment by the Sanhedrin. Let's look at this portion as though it refers to any verbal cruelty to anyone, so we don't give ourselves any latitude to escape this teaching. In the original, Jesus says something like this, and this is another paraphrase. If this is what is coming out of your mouth, if these are your cruel words, then you are subject to the judgment and discipline of the religious court. You will be answerable to them, and you will be required to submit yourself to worldly punishment according to them. Now the implication here is that disciples should avoid judgment by the council by demonstrating self-control over their self-expression. Not everything needs to be said. Not every right needs to be exercised. Our outrage does not always need to be given an outlet. The Apostle Paul summed up freedom in Christ this way. 
You say, I am allowed to do anything. But not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything. But not everything is beneficial. Restraint and discernment are the subjects here and are recommended here to curb behavior like judgmental insults that is off-brand for disciples. And exercising both comes with the added benefit of avoiding judgment by the council. Next, Jesus declares this. If you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. Well, that's just terrifying. But I learned this week that some optional punishments handed down by the religious court, the Sanhedrin, were these. Stoning, beheading, and being cast out of the city into the Valley of Hinnom, outside of Jerusalem, a place of pagan sacrifice which was continuously burning. Now, presumably, that last punishment was the worst. But the consequence relates to the severity of the crime, and that might not make sense to us in common English. To help us understand what's going on, let's look at this bit spoken by Christ from Luke chapter 6. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured onto your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In Christ's day, to say fool was to condemn a person with respect to their standing before God. That word denied the value of someone's personhood, and that is a pronouncement people have no right to make. Look at this. The Father has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Judgment does not belong to us. To condemn someone then is to stand condemned. To be unforgiving, is to be unforgiven, to murder with one's heart or words, thus rendering them dead by your intent, is to be dead in your own sin. Examine your heart. That's where corruption must be hammered out and refined so that we can effectively participate in God's righteousness as his image bearers. Examine your intent. That's that big chunk of ice under the water that we all have to deal with. Let's continue to work through the reading. When you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and sister, and then come and offer your gift. So far, Jesus has dealt with people's hearts as they direct their anger either literally or consciously toward their neighbors. Bottom line, it's disallowed. Now he says, if we have offended someone else, provoking their judgment against us, we also have to go resolve that. Otherwise, our conduct may lead th them to have unrighteous anger against us and to have unforgiveness in them and so lead them to their own destruction. It's like Jesus sees all this anger and resentment and unforgiveness as a food fight in a cafeteria. It doesn't matter who started it. Once it gets going, everyone involved somehow gets stained by it. Even people on the periphery are caught up in it. Even the physical plant sustains damage. And so Jesus, the lunch monitor, jumps up on a table, blows his whistle, and shouts, stop. And then he adds, clean up this mess, all of you. And looking at the text, we can see that this need for cleansing is most especially true in the context of religious exercises. He's specifically saying that if the people of God are presenting their offering to the Lord, let's say that's you entering into prayer or communion or tithing or outreach work, all of that is good. But if you have been otherwise offensive towards someone, go handle that first and then return to faithful work and discipline. Go apologize, repent, make amends, be better. And in the same way, if you're upset about something someone did to you, seek to be reconciled, forgive, be better. Or in both cases, you will face the judgment that follows ungodly anger, and so will your counterpart. 
Now, one final example of this teaching is where Jesus says, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on your way to court with him. Again, this is an admonition to be reconciled under your own terms, which is far better than to subject yourself and your accuser to outside judgment. In this case, the government. Resolve your issues, says Christ. Lay down your right to avenge in humility. Make peace. It is better to restore a relationship on mutual terms rather than to subject yourselves jointly to the judicial and punitive systems of the state. It is far better to defer together to the law of God, which promotes compassion and affirms empathy and requires selflessness and seeks justice for all, rather than to be systematically and maybe irreconcilably divided by a human court. By now, I hope all this reminds us of what preceded this portion of the text as it was compiled in Matthew. Remember the words we first heard a couple weeks ago from Jesus on the mountain. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And then this. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And then this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. And today, we're seeing Jesus get down to the nuts and bolts of kingdom law. The law, he explains, is more than what is on the page. At the same time, God's law is limited by his own divine intent, not to be expanded on or weaponized by the world's ideology or our private interests. The Lord is the arbiter. He is the judge. Christ is our righteousness. He is our advocate. And our duty toward the whole law is to actively, constantly, selflessly love. That's it. That's how we represent Christ. That's how we honor him and how we magnify him, not for our own sake, but for the sake of the world. And generally, that's lived out in words and deeds involving our neighbors. Imagine a world bereft and how it feels of love and unity. Now, what if love rained down? What if light shone in the darkness? That would be the precise image of the people of God enacting the commands of God concerning our neighbors. That's where hope resides and where transformation begins with law-abiding Christ followers actively and personally and collectively investing in a kingdom-wide mission that is rooted in justice and mercy and which is propagated by indiscriminate acts of human kindness. And we get there by choosing love and kindness daily. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. These two laws of love are carried out by law-abiding kingdom citizens through intent and action. In the same way, the sixth commandment, which prohibits murder, has components of both intent and action. And in both cases, our heart, our mind and motivation is known to the one alone who has the right to judge and to whom we will ultimately answer for our thoughts and our words and our deeds. Which leads me to recommend two action steps as a final response to the reading today. First, we should confess our sins. And second, thinking back to the problem of heart disease, we could decide to get better. Let's read this confession together. I take a moment, breathe, settle ourselves to do the real work of confession, not just to recite it, but to let it affect us. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Now, let's go live out this week better than the last in humble, merciful, lawful, delightful ways. Grace and peace. Rejoice in knowing that we never walk alone. Know the grace and peace of Christ walking beside us, guiding and protecting us. Share this comfort with one another and feel his presence each moment of each day. Amen. You heard that.